Now we would like to present to you tonight one whom I believe could be considered the beloved of the Lord and a friend to all the true children of God, Brother William Brown. God bless you tonight. Thank you, Brother Tom Trudy. Amen. Good evening, friends. It's really a grand privilege to be here tonight and one thing to be back in Arkansas and another thing to be on the campground. I believe this is my first uh, camp meeting that I have attended for a, a long time. And I had the invitation to come and, and to begin with you. And I've heard since you've just come in, you've been having a wonderful time here at this meeting. Praise I'm so thankful for that. And I, coming up along the road a few moments ago with my son, and we were talking about Years ago, when I first come down here to Arkansas, it was the first of my meeting. When I first started off, it was in Arkansas on the evangelistic type of the meetings anyhow. And since then, been seven times around the world. Praise and now, God. back in Arkansas, <laughs> like bad money always returns. <laughs> I have, everywhere I've been, I suppose, in the United States, I've asked any uh, people here from Arkansas, I've always had friends from Arkansas, but pretty near everywhere. Right. And I've always said some of the truest hearts I believe it ever beat was are them old blue shirts down here in Arkansas. Real fine people. Right. I love you. And I, I'm grateful to God for the opportunity to be back tonight in Arkansas, be here with you. And um, so I think we got three nights yet left in the convention and to have the opportunity to come in and express my love to Jesus Christ and have fellowship with you people and our fine bunch of brethren here, many of them, I don't know, I just looked around and seen one that I do know, Brother Jack Moore, I just happened to, Sister Moore, I happened to recognize them then, and we're certainly happy to be in. Now, I know all day long you must get tired, you know, physically tired. We never get enough, uh, uh, get tired praising and blessing God for his goodness, how wonderful he is. And, but all day long, and then when nighttime comes, then uh, here I come in. And I, I'm one of those ministers that's been given the idea of speaking a long time. But uh, I don't think we'll do it now because of this uh, squeeze in the convention. You've heard great speakers, no doubt, all through the day and through the convention. And then to stand up here in a platform uh, before all these fine speakers that I feel pretty small <laughs> and uh, stand here. Uh, one of the ministers that just shook hands with told me this is her first services to have in this uh, tabernacle, I would call it. Uh, I don't know just exactly what the temple or whatever it is. And we're, we're certainly thankful again for the opportunity to come into a new church, something that's erected to the praise and honor of God. Yes, amen. How wonderful. And we are... I've just moved back, or not moved back, just come back from the, for the school vacation for the children. We live in Tucson, Arizona now, and it's been awfully hot out there, but we um, find it's a little bit hotter here at home than it was out there because of the tremendous humidity, and it kind of puffs us down if you're getting kind of used to the air there. We got in home and had the first service last Sunday, and we've seen the Lord Jesus uh, continuing his great work of love and power among the people. And the same gospel that I preached to you 15 years ago here in Arkansas, I still believe the same thing. I just don't change it. It's Christ. Sunday, it was something taking place at the church. Just happened to look around to see the gentleman on which the, the miracle was performed. You know, there's, we all love to brag on, on the Lord Jesus. We, we love to. I had a woman one time to tell me, she said, that's the only fault she could find with me. 
I brag too much about Jesus. I said, I'm sure to go to heaven. <laughs> That's all the faults I had. <laughs> Bragging on Jesus. And so she, uh, she was just didn't think he was divine. She tried to say he was just a man and a philosopher, a prophet or something on that order. But I said he was God. Amen. And, so he, and she said, I can prove to you that he wasn't God. And I said, oh, I don't believe you can do that. And she said, I can prove he's only human. I said, I, I'll admit he was human, but he's both human and divine. She said he couldn't be divine. And I said, oh, hey, he was divine and he is divine. She said, oh, he couldn't be. He said, I'll prove it by your own Bible. I said, all right. And she said, on St. John the 11th chapter, on the road down to the grave of Lazarus, the Bible said Jesus wept. I said, well, what's that got to do with it? She said, well, if he, if he weeps, it proves he's not divine. I said, lady, your argument is thinner than the broth made out of a shadow of a chicken to starve to death. I said, well, you know better than that. I said, he was, he was human as he went to the grave of Lazarus crying. That's right. But when he straightened his little shoulders up and said, Lazarus, come forth, and a man had been dead for four days, stood on his feet and lived again, that was more than a man. <laughs> I still believe him to be that. Amen. Sunday while speaking, we, I was asking the people to turn around in the tabernacle and shake hands with each other. And there's a, a dear friend that just learned to love him. He just come into the church, he and his wife, his wife's registered nurse and he himself is an Englishman she's a Norwegian how that ever happened I don't know but, but uh, however they're both fine people and this um, this brother has had a little something wrong kind of in his heart and a uh, very fine Christian man and an intellectual man too he does secular work for accountants and so forth and he turned around and when he did, a heart attack struck him, and he pitched over the floor dead. And his wife, being a nurse, she grabbed him quickly and grabbed his pulse over his heart. It was gone. Now I looked at his face real dark. His eyes had turned back, not just closed his eyes, but his eyes pushed out in front. And he was, uh, I'd come over to the platform, try to get the audience quiet, and many people was trying to help the sister, of course, in that condition with her husband. Someone who laid something over his head, or under his head, rather. I took a hold of his heart, uh, uh, his pulse at his arm, and no more pulse than there is on that piece of wood. And then I knelt down and prayed, Lord Jesus, I pray thee, give back our brother away his life. And his heart beat four or five times and started off beating regular again. And he come back up again. And, uh, he was trying to talk. He couldn't talk. He was, the blood stops, you know, when the heart stops. And it was quite some time before his blood got circulating just right. I heard him call my name, and then I got back to the platform. Brother Way, I wonder if you'd just stand up so the people would see who the man was. That the man that dropped dead Sunday morning. <laughs> Sister Way, his wife, a nurse, who's standing there to take his pulse to see and she, and he. So, uh, that sounds very strange maybe to people who wouldn't believe these things, but I have seen the Lord Jesus raise the dead many times, and that's not new to us, so we wouldn't. I think it's fine to brag on Jesus, but I think it ought to be some truth what you're bragging about. Amen. So, uh, we've seen him, I've seen him in the last 15 years, uh, many infallible cases raise up the dead. Especially one in Mexico where Brother Moore and I was standing in Mexico City. A little baby had died one morning at 9 o'clock with pneumonia in a doctor's office. And a little woman, we couldn't get her to the, well, the man to give out all the prayer cards. And we just had to number them as they would come up. There was no more prayer cards. And this little Spanish sister, about, I guess, 25 years old, had a little uh, dead baby. It was raining and she had it under a blanket. And the night before that, there'd been a blind man that was all probably as old as my father would be, probably 70 years old, was uh, blind, and he received his sight when I was praying for him. And that night, 
platform practically as wide as this, this cross here with this rick of uh, all oh, way high, two or three feet with just shawls and hats and old garments that they laid up there. And this little woman was trying to get up there and Billy Paul, my son, came and said, Dad, I got 300 ushers there and all 300 can't hold that little woman. She had a dead baby under a little blue bank. I said, well, I said to Brother Jack Moore, go down. Brother Jack Moore and I have a lot of things in common. I don't want to say we look alike because he's such a handsome man, but uh, one thing about Brother Moore, we both part our hair the same way. <laughs> we have a lot of things in common. I thought she never did know me and had let me down on some ropes, I think, to get in. So I sent him down to pray for the little baby. I thought, well, they won't. she'll never know the difference. And so I was started to speak again when Brother Espinosa, many of you brothers know him, from the West Coast is doing the interpreting. This is out there by the bull ring and, and Mexico City. And I looked out over the audience and I seen a vision of a little Mexican baby sitting, smiling at me. So I said, bring the little lady here. So laid hands upon the little dead, stiff, whole farm. His feet began to kick and he began to scream and, and there he was alive and I sent a uh, runner Espinosa did to check with the doctor to get a statement before we could write it out. And the doctor wrote an affidavit that that baby died that morning in his office about 9 o'clock, and this is about 10.30 that night. And the baby's living today, enjoying good health, the honor and glory of God. So seeing many things take place, we wouldn't have to say about our brother away there, but truth is truth. And God doesn't do those things just to, he wants it to, uh, to be known and people to know that he loves them. And by the grace of God, Brother Way sets among us tonight living. We're thankful for that. I thought being on the campground coming in, just don't want to interrupt the great time. Billy was telling me this afternoon, said, you talk about real old fashioned Pentecost. Said, you wait till you get up there. Said, they sing like it. Had the experience for 50 years, I said, I guess some of them had <laughs> for 50 years. And I just love to get into a meeting like that. Amen. I believe every one of us do. Well, we just get right into it as, like a, I used to tell a little story about fishing. Up in northern New Hampshire, I was uh, fishing for trout. And way up the head of the mountain, I had a little tent sitting up there, all those little a tent, little pup tent from the government. And I found a place where many trout was back under a bush. And there was some moose willow there. And every time I tried to whip my fly, well, I'd catch the willow. So that morning I got up, went up there early, and I thought I'd cut them uh, willows down. I just, if I killed the fish, then I would eat it. Otherwise, I'd turn it loose. So I had all, we, all I could take care of, and I was up there by myself. And while I was gone that morning on my road back, an old sow bear and two little cubs got in my tent. And you talk about wrecking things. They really had wrecked it right. And they had tore everything up. And I, I thought, when I come back, I heard a noise. And I looked around at some little bushes I was coming around. And the old mother bear and all of them just having them a time raking through everything. And she saw me. And she ran off and cooed to her cub. One of the cubs come, the other didn't come. Little bitty fellow, spring is just so high. He's sitting like this. And I thought, well, what's the little fellow so interested in? And I got around a little, I said to her, get out of there, get out of there. And he just sat there. I thought, now watch the old mother because, you know, <laughs> who was her cub, she would scratch him. You know? So I, I, I watched, he was a tree pretty close, you know. I had an old rusty pistol laying over there in the tent that probably broke up then. And anyhow, I wouldn't want to shoot the old mother and leave two orphans in the woods, so I kept watching this tree and getting around to see what the little fellow was so uh, fascinated. And you know, I, I, I like pancakes. I, we, we're all Southerners, aren't we? Yeah. Flapjacks is what they are down here, you know. So I really love them, and I... And I, I'm no, not much Methodist about me. I really like to pour on the molasses. I really baptize them right, pour it all over them. So I, I don't like just a little bit of sprinkle like you get in these places here in a little thing. I like to get where you really pour it on, you know. 
get them mixed good and heavy. I had me a half a gallon bucket full of, of good old sorghum. And this little bear got the top off these, really enjoyed my molasses. And I kept watching him around the corner. He take his little paw and stick down in this bucket, you know, and he didn't know how to get the molasses out, so he, he just stick his paw down in my molasses, and then he'll rig it up and lick when he comes by. <laughs> I tell you, when I finally got around and got his attention, he looked at me, he couldn't see me. He was molasses from the top of his head and all the way down. His little belly, just as full of molasses, and his eyes, he couldn't even open his eyes to look at me. You know, trying to... I hope oh, that's right. There's no condemnation of them that's eating. <laughs> but then it might have a good old Pentecostal meeting when we get our arms down in that honey jar about that deep, you know, that Pentecostal honey. You know the strange thing about it? Actually, you got... His tummy full, and my bucket stopped out. He went over to his mammy, little brother, and the mammy licked him. <laughs> you know, I hope we get so much on this year that when we go home, those who didn't come will lick off us. <laughs> of Tell them about what great things the Lord did down here in, in Hot Springs. Lord bless you. And now I believe... Uh, they told me uh, if they didn't get a time or something other to announce to give out some prayer cards to pray for the sick, some numbers on cards, we call them and pray for them. And I like that because give me one night to kind of uh, get acquainted. And uh, so tomorrow night I think they're going to give out their prayer cards sometime in the afternoon. Is that it? Yeah. You've already six o'clock. Six o'clock tomorrow evening. Now I thought tonight we'd take just a little uh, portion of the scripture here and read it and see if we could uh, find what the Lord would have to tell us. Now just before we open the book, let's speak to the author of the book as we bow our heads. Before we pray and your heads bowed and all the tears now and frolic of the day and a little sense of humors we've had, let's just push it aside now because we're approaching the king. Is there any special request that like to be remembered? Just would you raise your hand and say, Lord, right down in your heart, just hold your request. Our Heavenly Father, we deem this such a privilege, God Almighty, to come into the congregation of the Lord, to fellowship together testifying, telling of the great things that you've done and the places that we have been. And this just reminds me of Acts 4 in the Bible when they returned and was speaking of what the Lord had done. And they all prayed. And the place was shook where they were assembled together. God, we're not so anxious tonight to see the building shut, but we would like for you to shake us, Lord. Shake our understanding. Shake our being, our emotion, our heart of understanding that we might leave here tonight more determined than ever to serve you. That we might feel the presence of a new, fresh Pentecost of the Holy Spirit pouring out upon us a fresh and a new, like down in these woods and hills in Arkansas 50 years ago when the forefathers come to here, horses and wagons are preaching this gospel. Dear Lord, may we the barriers of this great worthy cause that you sent to the earth, may we not be ashamed of this great thing, but may we Walk in the footsteps of those who went before us, Lord, packing the banner of the Lord Jesus. May others who have not yet accepted this great plan of salvation that God laid down for us in the Scripture foretold all the way down to the Old Testament, and today we're enjoying it. May there be a great shaking among us, Lord, and a renewing of faith and, and a renewing of efforts. I thank you for this convention, for this bunch of people who are still holding on, Lord. And this hour of trial has come up on the earth to try those who are professing to be Christians. 
May we be found at the end worthy to enter into the joys of the Lord that's been prepared for the redeemed since the foundation of the world. Bless thy word. Lord, remember every hand that went up. You know the objective. You know the motive. You know the request behind that hand. I pray, God, that you'll grant it to each one. May every man, that a woman, boy or girl, that put up a hand that, that wanted more salvation or a closer walk, or to know you as your Savior, may they never leave this ground till that request is answered. To those who are sick and needy, we pray, God, there will be such a wave of healing across this place that there will not be a feeble person that comes on this ground or leave in the way that they come on. You can raise a man up from the dead and present him here before us. It shows that you're the same God that stood there by the grave of Lazarus, called him out from among the dead. God, to let know that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever here stands one among us tonight. Just a few days ago, called back from the land beyond the shadow of man's knowing in this life. How we thank thee for this. Bless us together now as we study your word, for truly thy word is truth. Thy and thy word are one. They cannot be separated. So we ask your blessings upon us, Father, as we wait upon you to speak to us tonight through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, if you will, and like to turn to scriptures and so forth, I kind of laid down on the bed and went to sleep. The first thing you know, Billy come up and said, let's go. I said, you mean it's church time? I had to pull out a little bunch of scriptures I'd used before to, to speak on tonight. And I thought maybe it'd be to give out some cards and be praying for the sick and so forth. I noticed since of coming here, two people laying on cots perhaps come to be prayed for tonight. Now, and, uh, and Billy come back and said, I just didn't get any time. Daddy talked about it. said, we'll, we'll try it tomorrow night. I said, all right. You get the brethren and give it some cards out. So now I want you to turn with me to the, the book of Second Kings and the first chapter. And then also I want you to turn in there uh, to Jeremiah the 8th chapter and 22nd verse. Let's read just a portion of this scripture. Then Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. And it has a fell down through the lattice in his upper chamber that was in Samaria and was sick. And he sent messengers and said unto them, Go and inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Akron, whether I shall recover of this disease. But the angel of the Lord said unto Elisha the Tishbite, Rise and go up and meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say unto them, Is it not because there is not a god in Israel that you go to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Akron? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord God, thou shalt not come down from the bed on which thou hast gone up, but thou shalt surely die. And Elijah departed. And then in the book of Jeremiah, the 8th chapter and the 22nd verse, is there no bomb in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is the health of the daughter of my people not recover. I want to speak, if we call it on the subject, why? It's a, it's a question. And God's asking this question. And God is eternal. We know he is. He's everlasting. He never had a beginning or he can never have an end. Eternity never started. It never ends because it's eternal. And God cannot change his mind nor his way. That's why that we as people who will not accept creed, if it's contrary to the word, because we believe that 
God and His Word is the same. Amen. We believe that the Bible says in St. John, the first chapter, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Therefore, when God says anything, He can not tomorrow or any other time ever take it back. When God's ever called on the scene to make a decision, and His one decision is eternal, it can never be changed. When God was called to make a decision for the human race in the Garden of Eden when the first sin was committed, could He ever be able to redeem His lost child back into fellowship with Him again? And He fixed one program that's never changed by the way of the blood. And follow the Scriptures. It never did alter or change, and it never can because it's God's decision by the blood. Although we tried to alter it, we tried to educate it, we tried to denominate it, we tried to do everything there is in man's law to try to change that like Adam did by fig leaves and so forth, but it still ever remains. The blood is the only place of fellowship. Therefore, together tonight we can stand not as one denomination, maybe many of us together, but we can't stand here to represent one denomination. We have to stand here in this fellowship under the blood of Jesus Christ. We can all be brethren, sisters. God makes a way for a man, and then man refuses to walk in that way. Then God's got a right to ask, why didn't you do it? That's what he did then, and that's what he does now, and that's why he, what he'll ask at the judgment. They ask why. Now, our scripture reading started off just immediately after the death of Ahab, a bad king, a borderline believer, a man who knew what was right to do, and yet did not have the courage to step out and do what he knew was right to do. I just think of this. If this world isn't contaminated today with Ahab, this Christianity that we live in is contaminated with Ahab, with man who really knows that it's right to give your life and be to God and be filled with the Spirit and to follow the teachings of this Bible, and yet without the courage to stand and do it. Reminds me again of another situation like that in Sodom. The Bible said the sins of Sodom vex the righteous soul of Lot daily. And how that the man's soul was righteous, and he looked out upon the sins of the land, and he knew that what was wrong, that they were doing wrong, but yet without the courage to stand for his conviction, no wonder the whole world has become a Sodom and Gomorrah. And how that the lots today across the nation and around the world, standing in churches who is convinced that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and His power is just as real today as it ever was, without the courage to stand in the pulpit and uh, denounce sin because of some barrier that would excommunicate them from a fellowship that they have joined into, still comes back to the blood of Jesus Christ, the only remedy. Why? Why? Ahazel was a was the son of Ahab, had been brought up in a kind of a home that, that was a, a lukewarm home. A, it wasn't altogether Christian. His mother was a heathen, and his father married out of fellowship, married a woman that was not a believer. That always makes a bad home for any kid to be raised in, that when unbelief and faith tries to mix together. Now, if the father would have been a real strong man in his faith, the child might have had a better opportunity, but he, he didn't. He didn't have, he knew that there was God, he knew that there was a Jehovah, and then he, his mother's gods and so forth is all confused. Then at the death of his father, this boy in this uh, condition, kind of uh, mixed up one way and another. And if that ain't a picture of the lands today, Amen. one in the families this way and one another, and one going this way and one going that way, no wonder we're producing so much 
juvenile delinquency and all other kinds of stuff under the name of Christianity. It's because there's no unity. There's no real call out and stand for God. Now, we find that this fellow falling heir to his father's throne, one day up in the top of his balcony somewhere, walking around, he, he fell through the, the lattice. Might have been over intoxicated and fell through the lattice down probably on the bottom floor, struck a bench or something and broke a few ribs or bruised him up. And the sickness must have started an infection somewhere of the bruise and caused him to have fever. He was pretty sick. Of course, them days they didn't have the remedies that they had now. Perhaps the doctors came and done what they could for the fellow. But they didn't have the sufficiency. Then he know his only thing that he could do would be to go to a higher power than what the doctors could produce and their terminology of, of medicine. And he thought he would go then and he sent to his mother. What a lesson that ought to be to mothers. A kid will usually listen to his mama. And he went to his, sent to his mother's God. Beelzebub, over to Akron, where this statue was, his monument, and said, go consult the priest over there, and let them consult this statue of uh, Beelzebub, whether I will recover of this sickness that I have or not. But you know, that man really, could you imagine a people who were supposed to be a God-fearing people would let such a man rule over them? is because of lukewarm condition. It was the condition that the church had got into that put such a person in power or permitted it. I don't think times have changed very much. And they still seem to be a whole lot the same way. And let this man rule, have a say so over their country that would consult some statue, uh, some pagan idea about his condition. And then, you know, but behind all of it, no matter how much it seems that God has turned his face from the people, he does that sometimes to see what kind of an attitude you take. Every son that cometh to God's got to be tried and chastened. And then there's a little spot in a man or a woman when they're born of the Spirit of God that's eternal. And you'll get into a place sometimes that where every, everything that's human about you in reasoning, the devil can reason it away from you. But when it all breaks away, then if that eternal life isn't there, you'll fall also because you can read yourself away from God. But a man that claims to be a Christian has no right in a pulpit or has no right as an office or a leader anywhere until first he's climbed them steps into a place to where he's born to the Spirit of God, filled with the Holy Ghost in such a way that nobody can explain it away from him. God, when he sent Moses down to Egypt to deliver the people, first he took him on the back side of the desert and took all the theology he had in him out in 40 years, and then appeared to him he knew more about God in five minutes in the presence of that burning bush than he know in the 40 years of learning that he got out. That's what the church needs tonight is another burning bush experience. Where slip-tongued people, where the scripture says that the two spirits in the last days will be so close to see the very elected if possible. A man ought to first get on that sacred ground with God where all the theologians, all the doctors of divinity, all the reasonings, all the atheists, nothing else can ever explain that away from him. He was there when God come and he knows what took place. You can't reason out of him. He was there when it happened. That's the kind of man we need today in the government, in the church, and anywhere else. In a times like this, for leadership, we need a man that's filled with the Holy Ghost. That's what the church needs today, not a theologian but a spirit-filled, born-again man full of the Holy Ghost. I tell you, if we had more of that, the church would look a little different than it does in the present time. 
things would be different if we just had more man filled with God's Spirit. Not going after traditions of the elders and so forth. Now we find that this a fellow sent up there to get this information from, from, the, uh, uh, from the God of Akron, Beelzebub, but all the time God knew he was doing it. So he had a prophet down there by the name of Elijah. So he spoke to Elijah and said, go up there to a certain road and stand in that way. Messengers are coming up. You see, you cannot hide nothing from God. See, no matter what you're doing, now, how little did that fellow know that God was speaking to Elijah way down there in the wilderness somewhere, in a little mud hut somewhere, and could tell him to go stand on the corner of the road up there and speak to these fellows and tell them to get back down to him and tell him, Thus saith the Lord, he's not coming off of that bed. And he said, Ask him, Why did you do it? What makes you do it? Is it because that there is no God in Israel? Is it because he doesn't have a prophet? Is that the reason you did it? Well, you know what's happened. You know the scriptures. You've got them in your own uh, palace. The priests are around there. No doubt you've read him since a boy. And why did you do such a silly thing as that? I wonder tonight if Christ would come on the scene uh, over the nation today and bring this nation to judgment if that same question wouldn't been asked. Why is it? Is it? Why is it we're doing these things? Why are we fussing in the government whether we should read the Bible in public? And why is we're reading all this nonsense? Did not our forefathers set this constitution in order? Did not this nation be born upon the principles of the Bible? Aren't we here for freedom of religion to act in God the way we feel fit to act, the way that we are convinced is truth? But you see, we have done something like they did then. We're just letting everything, politics, swallow us up instead of respecting our faith in our God and man who stood for truth. And we're letting our politics run over that and voting in such stuff that's polluting this nation. And while we're coming to a judgment, God will rise on the scene someday with a mighty prophet speaking this generation and, and tell people and they'll see that it's God speaking, but they won't repent. It'll be just like it was then. He said, is there no God in Israel? Is it because there is, is no God? Same as Jeremiah said, is there no bomb in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Then if there, they could not answer that. Of course there was. But said, then why? Why did you do it? Why is the daughter of my people not healed? Now we wonder that tonight. Why? Is there no Bible? Is there no God? Is there no difference? If God is going to bring the people to judgment, he's got to have something to judge them by. There's got to be some standard. If he's going to judge them by the Catholic Church, then if they judge them by the Roman Church, the Greek Church is lost. The other Catholic churches are lost. If you judge it by the Greek, the Romans lost. If you judge it by the Lutheran, the Methodist is lost. If you judge it by the Methodist, the Lutheran's lost. You can't judge it by a church. There's too many different organizations of it. But God will judge the world, he said, by Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is the Word, and the Word is God, and he'll judge them by this Bible. God's standard. We must measure up to what the Bible says. And we wonder why we got so much confusion, so many organizations, so much differences, separating brotherhood and, and everything. It's because there is no bomb in Gilead? Is it because there's no physician there? I wonder if God would ask us that question. Now, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't exactly they didn't have a physician. They did. God was the physician. And it wasn't because there wasn't a God in Israel. There was a God. And they had a prophet to consult, to find out what these things are. But it was the king's own stubborn will. Exactly. And that's what's the matter in the nation today. It's the people's own stubborn will. Not because we don't have the same God 
that crossed the Red Sea with his people, that fed him 40 years in the wilderness. It's not because we don't have the same God that we had in the beginning. It's the people's own stubborn way. They don't want to bow down. They don't want to, to have anything to do with the holiness and purity of living, uh, the Bible way of living. They'd rather belong to church and put their name on a book and live like the rest of the world than to bow down to the promises and the commandments of Almighty God. That's what's the matter. That's the reason things are going the way they are. People get away from the Word. You'll never be able to get straightened out till we get back onto the right path. You built this building, you put that corner down here somewhere, you never get the building built. You've got to be laid on the foundation, and the foundation is the Bible. Doctrine of the apostles and prophets and so forth of the Bible. The king's own stubborn way. He just didn't want to, to stand down there. It wasn't very popular. God's real, true way of living has never been popular. It never will be popular. For the preaching of the gospel is foolishness to them that perish. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it's the power of God and the salvation to them that believe. Now, we find out here that the king was stubborn. Just something like a, a, today a patient will lay right on a wife. A patient went to a doctor and laid down on his steps. And he had some kind of a, a fever that uh, was going to kill him. And the doctor comes to the door and said, uh, say, I've got the, the medicine in here. He said, oh, I just think, come on in, I'll give you the, the injection, the inoculation. Well, I don't want your medicine. I didn't say, now, sir, I, I can help you if you'll just come on in. Well, I'm not coming in. <clears throat> and the man laid there on the doctor's steps and died. Die on the doctor's steps because he won't accept the uh, inoculation for typhoid fever or whatever what it is that he had. He won't accept the inoculation for it. And the man dies right on the doctor's doorstep. Now, the man, you can't blame the doctor if he has the, the medicine that will, that will cure the disease and the doctor's willing to give it and it's been provided. And the man said, come as close as the doctor's doorstep and sit down there and die. You can't blame the doctor. You can't blame the medicine. It's the man that's be to blame. Amen. Dying on the doctor's doorstep with a disease that there is, is a medicine to be cured, can cure it on the inside. Well, that's just a parable. But you know, God has the medicine inside of his kingdom that will cure every sin disease there is in the world. And the people sit right on the church doorsteps, not only that, but they sit right in the pew and die and are lost and go to hell because they refuse to accept the doctor's medicine. Amen. That's right. They absolutely refuse to take the doctor's medicine. Therefore, they die with the fevers, and the people sit in the church and hear the messages of God and believe them and won't accept it. They wouldn't say, well, now, I don't believe that's right. Some of them will come say, in grievance, say, yeah, I believe it's right, but you won't do it. See, you'll die dying in the pews of the church because they won't accept the remedy. They won't see what it does. It takes a little bit of the, the popularity out of the people. It kind of beats them up a little bit. They're afraid of that new birth. Uh, you know, any birth is a mess. I don't care what it is. If it's in a pink pen or a pink decorated hospital, it's a mess. And so is the new birth. It'll make you do things that you didn't think you would do. It'll, it'll straighten you up. But before you can ever get right, you have to come through that mess. That's right. Amen. Before seed can ever be born, it has to die and rot. And that's what's the matter with people today. They don't want to die and rot out to the world so they can be born again of the Holy Ghost. They're afraid of that new birth. They're, they're afraid it makes them do things that they don't want to do. It takes the popularity out of them. It takes the starch out of them. Oh, I tell you, I'm glad that there is inoculation tonight that'll take it out of you, brother. It'll take the world out. It'll make people 
people of brotherhood associate together regardless of denominational differences. It'll, it'll make a pair of overhauls, put our arms around a tuxedo suit and holler, brother, I'm glad to see you. Amen. Sure. But you, they're afraid of that inoculation. Oh, my. It's dangerous to refuse the doctor's medicine, you know, if, you, if you're going to him. It's afraid of, if you refuse the medicine, it's danger. You may die. But that, that, you just die physically from not taking the doctor's medicine. But how much more dangerous is it to refuse God's inoculation from sin? Here some time ago, I had a little six bound. Someone said to me, said, oh, Billy said, did you keep your religion during your sickness? Said, you know, you believe in divine healing. Did you keep your religion? I said, no, it kept me. <laughs> I, not the idea of me keeping it. It keeps me. When the blood of Jesus Christ was shed on Calvary, God made a preparation. When man first sinned, he left himself a great chasm that he crossed, leaving himself no way back. God, rich in mercy, accepted the substitute. And that was the blood of a lamb or a bullock. And that substitute lasted for years. Moses stood under the inspiration of God. When sin was not even divorced, it was just simply covered by the blood of bulls and goats. And he had uh, the glory of God upon him until he could speak flies into existence. He could speak frogs into existence. Because a word is a thought expressed and God brought his thoughts to Moses and Moses spoke them in words. And when the word spoke, the whole world was framed by the word of God. There used to be a time when I'd get to school, get some black ink on my on my shirt. Mama used to take my shirt off and say, hand it to me quick, honey, and she put some coal oil on it, and all he done is just scattered it, made a great big uh, rain spot where she put the coal oil in the ink. That's all she knowed about. That's the best she had. But it's different today. They've manufactured a stuff called bleach, and you it's a chemical that whenever that ink drops back into that Clorox or bleach, whatever it is, when it strikes that, you cannot find that black no more at all. What happens to it? Drop a drop of black ink in a tub of bleach? Well, you don't have nothing. You can't find any fumes. If I was a chemist, these, these uh, words may not be just exactly uh, true to science, but I'd say, what is it? It's a H2O, water for one thing. Then there's a chemical in it and made it black. There's only one original color, and that's white. All other colors are perversions from that. Well, now I say, and then if you'd break it up from there, maybe you'd say, well, it turned into an acid when it hit the bleach. It turned to an acid. All right, then where did the acid go? The acid went back, now it's coloring we're talking about in this, the color. Say it went back to molecules. What well, say molecule four times six plus nine makes molecule H. If it come out four plus six plus eight, what would it come out? Pink instead of black. Then it went back from there to atoms. Then from atoms plus one plus B2 plus three made four, which put it with molecule H, means what? Then you come back to black again. And then when you go beyond that, you might go to electrons. Where do you go to from there? You have to go back because it is a creation. It had to come from a creator. You have to make it. Therefore, it went all the way back to its creator. That color that was in that ink, it can never return again. Now, God, seeing that the blood of bulls and goats could not take away sin, he never manufactured, but he created a chemical in the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. That sin once confessed and that you, you don't even bridge that chasm. You take the chasm completely away, and God don't even know what you ever sinned. That's right. He said he put them in the sea of forgetfulness to remember them no more at all against you. Then men and women stand in the presence of God as sons and daughters of God. The very nature of their God in their hearts. Where is the church today, brother? What happened to the church when we can see that the blood of Jesus Christ so remitted sins that God don't even remember we sinned? Then whatever you ask in my name, that I'll do. Amen. What's the matter is because somebody's been indocumenting these scriptures for the people. 
This is the only thing that I can figure has been done, because God's remedy is still the same. Now, the dangers to refuse the doctor's inoculation, how much more God? Now, how does man ever find medicine, anyhow, to work on a human being? You know what chemists do, or, or scientists? They take a disease and find out what kind of a germ is in it, then they get some kind of poison, antidote, and so forth, enough poison not to kill you, and enough antidote to keep it from doing it, and they inject it first into a guinea pig. They give the guinea pig the disease that you got. Then they put the medicine in the guinea pig, and if the guinea pig survives it, then they give it to you. <laughs> so that's quite a thing, you know. Uh, give it to the guinea pig and see if he can take it. And if the guinea pig don't die, then they give it to you. Now, not, not, not all people are made like guinea pigs, you know, so it, it kills some and, and hurt, helps the other. But there's one thing about this inoculation that Jesus Christ gives, it helps everybody. Yeah. It's not a remedy, it's a cure. You hear people say today, number one killer is heart disease. I, I differ with them. Not to be different, I just differ because I know it's wrong. Number one killer is sin disease. Right. Not, not heart disease, it's sin disease. You know, some people say, well now, Brother Branham, I think you stretched the blanket there a little bit. Now, let me ask you something. A man has to sin, I just have to sin a little bit every day. That's because you've never been inoculated, that's all. <laughs> Yeah? You never tried God's remedy. That's right. If you do that, then you wouldn't do it. Say, I just have to smoke. Something just makes me smoke. Try the inoculation one time and find out where it, where it works now. You say, I, I just can't keep from doing this. I, I, well, you just, you just take God's toxin one time and see how it does to you. A woman said to me not long ago, I was getting on to her about wearing these little scandal clothes. And she said, now, Brother Branham, let me tell you, you have no right to say that. We got a right to wear shorts if we want to. I said, I guess that's right. But if you was a Christian, you wouldn't want to wear them. She said, she said, and she said, well, now, wait, Brother Bram. She said, you know, they don't make any other kind of clothes but just those sexy clothes and so forth like that. I said, they still got both goods and make sewing machines. There's no excuse. That's right. Because they don't want to take the inoculation of the purity of the Holy Spirit. Oh, fashion, God save can't need any holiness. Oh, right. Used to be wrong to do those things. It's still wrong. Yeah. Right. But what's the matter? There's something happened. It used to be that, uh, that uh, people would act like that. They were uh, even excommunicated from society. Now they can't be brought into society until they do do it. And so you see, it depends on where your heart is, there your treasures are also, or where your treasures, your heart is also. You must remember that if you love the Lord with all your heart, you live clean and pure. My wife and I went over to the supermarket here some time ago, and we seen a strange thing, a woman with a dress on. It was a strange thing in our country. And uh, Meadie said to me, she said, Bill, I know that uh, them, some of them women sing in choirs down here in the churches. She said, I, I know them. And she said, now, uh, why, what makes them? I said, well, you see, honey, I said, being a missionary and myself, I said, we, uh, we are of a different country. She said, what? I said, we are of a different country, a different nation. She said, uh, uh, aren't we Americans? I said, we live here, but this is not our home. <laughs> we are pilgrims. <laughs> we are seeking a city whose builder and maker is God. I went into Finland. I seen the way they acted in Finland. I went in, and down into Germany. I seen the way they had the German spirit. I went down into Switzerland. They had the Switzerland spirit. I come to America. They got an American spirit. He said, well, then what about us? I said, we're born from above. Yeah. Heavenly. We're purity and holiness and righteousness and honesty. Yes. I said, therefore, those who profess that look not upon the things of the world, but we plainly say by our lives and the way we live that we have a God, we have a kingdom, we have a place that we're going, and this is not our home. Amen. My, I like that. I begin to feel pretty religious right now. Yes, sir. I believe in this old time Holy Ghost salvation. Oh, Live one time, still lives today. His same, of, his same doctrine of holiness just lives tonight, the same as it ever lived. Just the same thing. Yes, sir. Notice, 
the people has got away from the doctrine of it. That's all. Yes. Now, yes, sir, it's our number one heart disease, doesn't the main thing that kills the people today, it's number one sin disease. And sin is unbelief. Unbelief in what? The Bible. That's right. Yes, it's the number one sin disease that kills the people today, both spiritually and and that'll make them kill them physically, of course, because they already can prove that man that holds grudges and women who fuss and stew and fight and argue, they die and cause cancer, fungus, everything else to set in ulcers. See, you were made to be happy and free. You were made to live like children before your father and, and know that he makes every day everything work right for you each day. Yes, sir. The people are just afraid of this new birth. That's all. They're afraid to come to it because it'll straighten them up. It'll make you quit playing bingo, quit playing these slot machines. It'll make you quit staying home on Wednesday night from prayer meeting to watch We Love Susie and all those other crazy things that Hollywood's got and that dirty jokes is cracked over there and you'll make, it'll make you let your hair grow out long. It'll make you act like a lady. It'll make the man quit smoking cigarettes and being in the church as deacons. It'll make the people quit lying, stealing. It'll do something for you. It'll clean you up and give you a salvation that there's nothing in the world can explain it away from you because you know you were there when it happened. Yes, sir. Now, as I said a while ago, when God, when man finds medicine, the thing that they do, they search for this remedy, then they find this disease, then they inject it into a guinea pig and see if the guinea pig survives it. Now, when God was going to bring down this inoculation I'm speaking of tonight, this bomb of Gilead, he didn't find a guinea pig. He come himself. Amen. The only way he could do it is come in the form of his son. Amen. And was made flesh and dwelt among us in order to take the sting of death. Amen. He come to die. The only way he could die, he couldn't die as a spirit, as a man. So he was formed a body called Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And God Amen. dwelt in this body, yes. making Amen. himself Emmanuel on earth to take away the sin of man. Yes. That was that chemistry. It was in that blood. Somebody said he was a Jew. He was not a Jew. Some of them said he was a Gentile. He was not a Gentile. He was nothing less than God. The Bible said that we are saved by the blood of God. The blood comes from the male sex. We know that. The hemoglobin is out of the male. The female is only the egg. Right. Like I said, the right springtime, these old mother birds are building nests out here and laying eggs. Some of them lay a nest full of eggs they'll never hatch, too. Why? She, she could lay a nest full of eggs and she could set on them and just be so loyal. She could turn them eggs each day and stay there away from food until she gets the poor. She couldn't hardly fly off the nest. No matter how much she babies them and how much she pets them and how loyal she is to them, they'll never hatch. Why? She hasn't been with the mate and they're not fertile. Therefore, they'll just lay there and rot. That's what's the matter with a lot of our conferences. That's what's the matter with our camp meetings, many of them today, and our conferences. What do we get? A bunch of pets and 65 preachers that ought why it's a disgrace. They come in there because it's got a little prestige or a little education, push them up above something. I, my the only thing we need today is uh, we got a nest full of rotten eggs. What we need is a good old nest cleaning time. Men and women that's filled with the Holy Ghost, that's filled with the mate Jesus Christ, that's filled with the Spirit that he was baptized with. Right. Then we got life in the camp. Yes, sir. Proxene. They're afraid of it. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, when he was born, some of them said, well, now he was, he, he was the egg of Mary. He wasn't. If Mary had to get that egg down through the tube and through the womb, there had to be a sensation. So you see what she put God doing? He was neither no part of it. God the Creator overshadowed the Virgin Mary and created the cells within her womb and brought forth a man which was Emmanuel, God Himself, made flesh with no help from anybody. He's the Creator who made the first man. Amen. Oh, my. There he is. There he stands. Yes, sir. And then he did that so he could take the inoculation. Any real good scientist, good doctor that finds a disease, some of them will go over to a prison camp and get some man to try it out. It's going to have life in prison. If he survives the inoculation while 
then the poison don't kill him, he can go free if he's ready to take the inoculation. Prisoners wait for that. Oh, that's a doctor that's afraid of his medicine. But you know, God was afraid of his own medicine. Hey. Being a manger, a man standing on the banks of the Jordan when the inoculation fell down there, he seen it like a dove coming down from heaven, and he was inoculating a boy. He said, This is my beloved son, in whom I please to dwell in. Amen. God in man. That's an operation. God in man. The world watched him. Every temptation he stood up. When he snipped his face, pulled a beard out, spit on him, it stood the temptation. In the hours of trial, it stood the temptation. It held. The inoculation he received the Jordan, it held. It held in the times of popularity. For yeah. some of a lot of uh, churches today, God will bless them, they get started. That's what's hurting our Pentecostal people. Yeah. Yeah. We ought to be back like our grandfathers was, with a tin pan or a tambourine down the corner somewhere, beating the tambourine that would be in some of these big morgues that we're building today, trying to fashion after the other people. What we need is a good old-fashioned outpouring of the Holy Ghost and a cleaning up to the entire truth. Right? Now, the thing of it was that when the Holy Spirit came down upon Jesus at the day of his baptism, he was inoculated. We watched him in the hour of trial when the devil tried to give him all the kings of the world. What did he do? He stayed right with the word. Amen. Amen. What I'm wondering today is that many brethren out on the field since this last day revival. Why is it when you get a few nickels or a change of clothes, you're too big to go somewhere? Too much, oh, something other than you have to have something bigger than others to become a regular rat race. It's a shame God wants men that will humble himself to get down to the place somebody that you can speak to. But it's become such a rat race. Everybody trying to get something bigger than the other fella. The, if, see, they can't stand that presence of the temptation of Satan. But our Lord stood the temptation. The inoculation held. When the time come where the debate on the scripture, he stayed exactly with the word. Amen. Satan said it's written. He said it's also written. Glory. God in man. What do you have? He had something with him to back up every word he said. He said, if I do not the works of my father, then don't believe me. But if you can't believe me, be the, believe the works that he does through me. Oh, there you are. What we need is men and women like that today that can shut the mouths of the world by the signs of the Holy Ghost. We need a camp meeting like that. We need a turning up, side down, a shaking out. A lot of the world and things out of the church has come in in these last days. Money scattered out through the country and big things has got the people minds on big things instead of on God. Yeah. Compromising. Yeah. Compromising with the scripture. Yeah. Many a brother who started right on that way, but to get popular in some organization, compromised on what he believed. Yeah. That blood doesn't run in a genuine Holy Ghost born man. Yeah. All devils in hell can't upset him on that word. He'll stand on that regardless of what they call it. Amen. Paul yeah. oh, said there's nothing present or future can come or anything can separate us from the love of God. Right. 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 That real genuine birth of the Holy Spirit comes into a man. Right. He's a son of God. There's no chasm between him and God. He's his son in his presence. Yeah. Amen. Oh, I like that. Yeah. I know that's true. Yeah. All right. We find out that in the hour of temptation for worldly fame, the inoculation held in the time of being called holy or uh, made fun of, put a rag around his face and his eyes, and hit him on the head with a stick, said, now if you're a prophet, tell us who hit you. And Roman soldiers, they see him discerning the thoughts of the people to stand out and if he stand here tonight, he could look down and tell that woman what was wrong with her and what was this and that. That's the way he did it. That's the way he still does it. Because he doesn't change. That a living God, that a man could fall out of the roof 
and the life go out of him, and a man standing there with God in him could lay his step over that man, and he lived again. Yeah. That same God lives tonight. Yeah. Hey Amen. He's the unchangeable God. Yeah. Church needs an inoculation. That's right. As David Duplessis once said, God don't have no grandchildren. That's right. We are Pentecostal brethren and becoming the children come into church and just say, Well, we're Pentecostal because Papa was. If Papa was a Pentecostal and got the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you'll have to get it the same way Papa did. Yeah. He don't have grandchildren, he just has sons and daughters. Yeah. Not grandsons and granddaughters, just just sons and daughters. It's true. So you've got to do the same thing they did on the day of Pentecost. You've got to have the same experience. You've got to have the same thing that they had. God don't never change his program. He never changes his way. He just does the same thing all the time. The way he lays down his program, he must hold to that each time. It's got to be the same thing. And if you'll do the same thing, the same results will come. Amen. That's right. Now we find out it held in time of temptation. It helped when everything was going wrong. It helped when all his friends were stuck him. He still helped. The inoculation helped. Then the devil thought, I got him now. He started up Calvary. The blood streaming out of his body. His garment wrapped around him. One big splash of blood. The devil must have said, I got him now. That can't be God. No, no. That can't be him. If he let them soldiers spit in his face, if he let them jerk handfuls of beard out of his face, if he let him challenge him to see a vision, and he didn't do it, and now here he goes up the hill, packing that cross. I'll have him in a few minutes. That bee of death come down circling around and sting him. You know, like any bee has a stinger in it. But, you know, God had prepared a flesh that time. It was a flesh of God. When that stinger once anchored in that Son of God into Emmanuel, when he pulled himself out, he had no stinger left. He took the sting right out of death. Go on, Paul, to say, death, where is our sting? He's a God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus. All right. All right. He can sting Elijah and die. He can sting Elijah and remain his stinger. But you know, if a bee, if a bee ever stings deep enough, he can't sting the more he pulls his stinger out. So there was no human flesh that he could anchor in. <laughs> no one that he could anchor in. But when he put it in a manual that time, he lost his stinger. Right. Thanks be to God. Yes, sir, he failed on that one. Yes, sir, they found out the toxin hell. They said, if you be the Son of God, come down off the cross. The high priest, the big dignitary of the church, said, tell us plainly now, if you're the Son of God, come down off the cross and save yourself and so forth. Let us see if you're the Son of God. He never opened his mouth and said a word. Now we find out that he died. He really died. He died until the sun and moon said he died. All nature said he died. The earthquake that had a nervous chill run over it. And when they see the very God they created, the earth was hanging on top of the earth and Emmanuel's blood dropping up on the ground. Yeah. No wonder he died. He died till everything said he was dead. And then we go to find out. Before he died, he said, you destroy this temple and I'll raise it up again. On the third day. <laughs> You'll never be able to keep it down. Destroy it and I'll bring it back up on the third day. They put a guard around to find out the inoculation was going to hold they see that it helped through temptation of sin, it helped through poverty, it helped through riches, it helped through all kinds of temptations. It still helped. But now it's in death. What's it going to do now? But on Easter morning, oh my, just before that sun rose up, that inoculation took a hold. <laughs> and when it did, death broke its barriers, the grave opened up, and he rose again on the third day and ascended on high. Shows that that inoculation is an inoculation of eternal life. You can't destroy it. Even the belly of hell can't hold it. The grave can't hold it. Death can't hold it. Nothing can hold it. It'll rise again. Jesus Christ said, All the fathers given me will come to me, and I'll raise it up again at the last day. Hallelujah. A man or a woman's been inoculated with this. Cannot stay in the grave. No grave can hold the righteous. Keep it no grave, no nothing else. Jesus Christ promised to raise you up again. Amen. Amen. Oh, I'm so glad of that. That inoculation. You know, when each morning it proved, and you know what it was? It was such a great thing to 120 people wanted to get inoculated. Now, if he can keep through temptation, 
There's 120 people who knew him real well. They wanted that inoculation. So right then he had to go up to the laboratory and fix the serum. <laughs> so he said, you go up there to see Jerusalem to get it all the farm are fixed up. And I'm going to send it down to you. So they went up to wait how the Christian church should be run. <laughs> what kind of inoculation would it take? <laughs> what, what would be the inoculation? How would they do? What would take place? Should they all go away to the seminary and learn to have a Ph.D. and a LLD? Should some priest come up the road with a coach in his hands and lick out, take the communion, and that's it? But there came a sound from heaven. The inoculation was on its road. Like a Russian mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. Cloven tongues set up on them like fire, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Have you ever seen the old temple, the picture of it? There's a little side door that went out, went up along the stair steps, went up in the upper room. They closed the doors and went into the cause. It was afraid. But I'm telling you, when they got inoculated like a fresh branded calf, they couldn't hold him. No, sir. Out of that room, he come out into the streets. He went. He was inoculated. Death, hell, persecution, life, that makes fun of made no difference to him. He was inoculated. Amen. Amen. Oh, my. Listen, Peter, stand up there. They begin to ask, uh, is there any more bomb in Gilead? <laughs> is there any more bomb in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Oh, yeah. We got plenty of bomb in Gilead. We got plenty of physician. That day, Dr. Simon Peter, <laughs> he was a physician. He said, I'm going to write you a prescription. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, and this is an eternal prescription, because it's going to be for you and for your children, and for them it's for all, frankly, it's for everyone who will call upon the Lord our God to call upon. I'm going to give it to you. So what can we do to get inoculated? There's where she lady. What can we do to be inoculated? He said, I'll write the prescription. He said, repent every one of you and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for this prescription is to you and to your children and to them as far off even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Oh my. You know what? When a doctor finds a remedy for a disease and he writes out a prescription and some quack druggist gets a hold of it and goes to adding a little of this and taking a little of this out of there, he'll either kill the patient or, or do something to it. The prescription doesn't even have any, any enough medicine in it to do any good. If it don't, it's so weak, it won't help the patient. And that's what's the matter with a lot of these seminary druggists today. They take the prescription out and add something else and sit on it, and you got to the same. When the Samaritans received it, they get inoculated, they had the same thing. When the Gentiles received it, they got the same prescription. Paul met a bunch in Acts 19 who had part of the prescription, not all. He said, that won't work. You're going to kill the whole thing. So he wrote it over for them. Told them how to do it. They got it the same way. And that's what's the matter today. There's plenty of bomb in Gilead and we got plenty of physicians, but the people are afraid of the prescription. Really? Praise be to God. Is there no bomb in Gilead? Is there no power of the Holy Spirit? Now, is there, this inoculation works on all. It did on the Jews. It did on the Samaritans. It did on the Gentiles. It does on everybody the same way. I'm a missionary. I go over into the land where the people there that don't even know which is right and left hand. And they stand there. You know what they do when they receive the Holy Ghost? Same thing you do. <laughs> same thing. Oh! What is it? It's for you and for your children and to them that fall. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call this same prescription works the same thing and the church will do the same thing it did at the beginning. Exactly right. Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. 
And by being inoculated by that life that was in the vine, the church that went out inoculated, they wrote a book of Acts behind it. Yeah. Now we got some substitutes. We got some grafted fruits. It, it lives off the life of the tree, but it won't bear the fruits. Yeah. That's right. I was standing with a friend of mine, John Sherry, over in Phoenix here not long ago. He had a tree there, an orange tree, that had about five or six different kinds of fruit on it. I said, I've never seen a thing like that. He said, they're grafted. I said, what kind of tree is it? Orange. I said, well, there's lemon, and there's lime, and there's tangerines, and tangelos, and, and grapefruit, many different kinds. I said, and all them raised off that same tree? He said, yes, yeah, all citrus fruit. I said, well, now, that's a strange thing. I said, now, this year, after all that fruit goes off, next year, it'll bring forth the orange. He said, oh, no. Mm-mm. No. He said, it'll bring forth the kind of the lemon. And I said, then that tree turned from a, you mean from a, the, the orange tree to what? He said, no, no. No, if it ever puts forth another leaf, it brings forth an orange. I said, <laughs> Amen. Brother, we've got such things as church denominations injected into this and living off of it. Call themselves Christians. But if the real life of that tree ever puts forth another branch of its own, it'll be another book of Acts behind it. <laughs> or he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. What the world is a treasure that they don't know nothing about. The people reading this Bible, if you read it from a denominational standpoint, you'll not get much from it. Amen. But if you just look at what it says and obey what the prescription says, read it, obey it, it'll make a different person. Amen. I just come from India here not long ago. I heard of a woman over here, she was uh, poverty stricken. Her son had went to India to be a doctor. And um, he got over there and he got away from his medical practice and got into another, I believe it was an electrical engineer or something, and this woman got poverty stricken. She just didn't have nothing. And so a charity was trying to come take care of her. And so they invested the case, and when they investigated, they found out that the woman had one support, and that was a son that was a very wealthy man in India. And he said, well, uh, uh, why don't your son support? He said, oh, I just couldn't ask him. He said, I'm his mother. He said, I'd just rather take charity. And I uh, asked my son, said, don't you ever hear from him? He said, oh, I hear from him at least once or twice a month. Then he writes some of the most sweetest letters that you ever read. He said, but it looked like he loved his mother enough and he had plenty of money. He'd be trying to take care of her instead of her having to go to charity. He said, well, perhaps if he knew I was this way, he said, he would, he would take care of me. But he said, you know, he doesn't know it. And I, I just feel embarrassed to tell my son like that. And he said, uh, and he still writes you sweet letters. He said, oh, some of the sweetest letters. And he said, he sends me the prettiest pictures you've ever seen. He said, the prettiest pictures, so let's see some of them. She went to her Bible, and she pulled them out. You know what they were? Bank drafts. India puts pictures on her bank drafts, you see. Pretty pictures. She had thousands of dollars converted from Indian money into American money. What was it? In the lids of her Bible, she had treasures that she thought were just pictures. But come to find out, it was real value to her. And brother, when you try to read of a painted bar, a penny bar, and somebody tries to tell you if the Holy Spirit isn't the same today as it was then, somebody tries to tell you the days of miracles is past, that Jesus Christ isn't the same yesterday, today, and forever, that they try to tell you, don't you believe it? That's not pictures. God Almighty sent that message to you. That's right. It's for you and for your children. To them it's far off. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call. God is still God. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's right here tonight to save the lost, to heal the sick, to fill with the Holy Spirit those who desire to be filled. You believe that, don't you? Yes, sir. If you believe it, then you see, that's God's promises in this word here. You can get right in there and find every promise. The promise isn't to you. Peter said the promise isn't to you and to your children and to them as far off. Don't be afraid to cash that. That's a bank draft on heaven. That's right. Jesus Christ the same yesterday and forever. What if he stood here tonight and seen that woman laying there sick? She looks like she's very sick, crippled, probably paralytic or something. Uh, two women, a uh, woman and a colored man and a colored woman trying to work with a little baby. What do you think he'd do if he stood looking at them two patients there as a healer? You think he can heal them? He's already done it. You see. When he died at Calvary, he done it. Do you believe that patient? you believe that child? You there with the little colored lady there with the baby. you believe Jesus Christ, when he died at Calvary, he purchased the healing of your child? you on the top there, if you're 
If you look very sick, you're paralyzed, whatever it is, you believe Jesus Christ died at Calvary to save you from your sickness. Do you believe that? Do you believe in what I've said tonight, that it's true? Do you believe that prescription's true? You do? If he stood here tonight and when you asked him, will you heal my child, you know what he'd say? I've already done that. See? You just believe it. See? If you say, sir, I'm crippled, can't walk, or whatever it is, I, I can't walk, I, I'm dying or something, will you save me? You say, I've already done it. See? Now, how would you know it was his voice? Because he would do something like he did then. He might be able to tell you something about yourself, tell you what you were, or what was wrong with you, or something like that, like he did in the Bible time. That would show he was the saint. But for healing, you'd have to accept it yourself. He was wounded for our transgressions. With his stripes, we were healed. Do you believe that? You think he could tell me tonight what your trouble or something about you in there? Will you accept and believe me to be his prophet? You will? What about you, the lady there? Make sure with your hand on your baby. You believe that? Well, how many will believe it? I have Father. Uh, uh, this is your service. I'm just, I'm just responsible for preaching your word. Now, I know this is unusual, but I pray that you'll grant it tonight that the people might know that, that this is true. All right, look this way. Your baby has some kind of a bone disease. That's right, it's got a big swelling in the leg. Is that right? Keep your hand on it. Repeat and say, Lord Jesus, heal my baby. I've served you all my life. If you've never took this inoculation, believe it with all your heart and put a string around that baby's leg tonight and measure it and bring the string back tomorrow where you cut it off and it's shrunk clean out tomorrow night. Will you do that? You lay in there next. You believe me to be his servant? I've never seen you in my life. But you're laying there shadow of death. He's a dark shadow over a woman. She's suffering, dying of cancer. That's exactly right. And you believe that God will make you well? Can you believe it? Then why do you lay there till you die? The doctor can heal that. Rise up in the name of Jesus Christ and take up your head and go home. 